good turnaround Tuesday, everybody. Let's have a good day. So yesterday I started off talking about the 78.6 level here in the Dixie. That could be ripe for a bounce. We've gotten it. So uh, I'd say that this is pretty critical for the bear case and the dollar to continue should start failing from here. So turnaround Tuesday candidate could be uh, the euro. Not crazy about that. It took out the 1720 breakout, but 1680, pretty good support. So we'll see if we could get a reversal back to the upside in euro. Well, this high was confirmed on the four hour. And pretty much so, not much divergence, pretty good reading on the one. So we'll see if we could get another blast and achieve uh, the targets up here. We had something like equality from here. We could get up to this 1860 level, take out the bears, and then maybe we'll take another look at it. So um, that's what I see there. US oil has really become kind of dormant here. Uh, could be a failing rally. You know, uh, maybe this was a and this is ABC for B. I don't know. I'm Dale Pinker. Sometimes I think I'm Greg Horvat, but he's much better. <laughs> so your first sign that a top is really going to manifest would be uh, action back under 73. Hi, David. How are you today? And uh, US dollar yen <clears throat> finally have taken out a lot of the bears. I think they're all gone now. Well, at least a lot of them, you know, took out this high and this high. So actually, um, it was smart not to go with last week's little reversal candle. That was kind of just like a trap. Uh, I think we should at least take this high out. That's 111.39. And I remember some longer term targets took us up towards 12, 12.20. And with risk on, that's possible. Um, kind of confirming the action up here if this candle closes good on the four hour. Uh, getting a little divergence on the one. So even if it's going to be some type of peak, there still should be another push up after some kind of pullback. So uh, the end probably getting closer. I uh, don't think it's going to come off dramatically until we get some type of peak here. And uh, I'm going to be king uh, shorts or whatever I do with my bearish ETFs off of the strength, which is, I'm going to have to ask Steve if he uses IWM for the Russell 2000. But we're almost at new highs here. Uh, it's not going to confirm this time. I believe Steve's levels were about 7180, 17180, 172. So it could take till you know near the end of the week for that to happen. It doesn't have the same oomph that we had yesterday. So looking for 172. Now this will be a new all-time high. Okay. Um, so would the Nasdaq. If uh, we get that new all-time high there, it'll be a new all-time high. But I know it feels like a new all-time high in the S&P, but it's not the all-time high. All we're doing is challenging and taking out the high before this pullback. And maybe they want stops above this level right here, over 2,800. And look, there's a 1.27 to a 28.17. So uh, even though NASDAQ and Russell, uh, Russell much closer, been leading the whole way up with a strong dollar. So if we're going to get a turn in the dollar, that could have some impact on the Russell. And I just wanted to show you, even though it feels like we're making new highs in the S&Ps, we're still 100 handles away, 90 handles away from this high up here. So I would say that most of the bears that thought we had it here, uh, I was one of them, fortunately covered half of my position and ETFs down here. I was just looking for a retrace to uh, 61.8, but 
turned out to be much more, but it doesn't mean that I'm not still stalking some short signals going into the second half of the month. So uh, those are some of the things that I see. We'll see if we get this reversal in the euro. Still has a lot of work to do if it's going to do it, but the beginnings of a reversal candle are there on a one hour and actually on the four hour actually getting one. Uh, should have at least 17 and a half in it if it pops from here. Oh, oh, thank you, Zia. So uh, any questions on anything I've covered or something you want me to take a look at before I hand it off to Blake? Warriors? Cable? Yeah, Cable had that negative day yesterday. Really fought its way back. Well, if you're bearish a dollar, I look at this high here on the one hour, and it looks like it's a confirmed high. Um, I know that we had 33 and a half identified as uh, resistance. Uh, Lydia even brought it up during the interview last week that we needed to get through 33 and a half before we had a shot for uh, 36. And I would say, if we get this from here, uh, we're gonna at least recover. So I have a hard time wanting to be short cable after this action that it held pretty well. And maybe we would get another shot back over three that could take us back to major resistance at 360. I hope that helps. I'm gonna save the rest of the board for uh, Steve. And I'll just give you my one look at silver because I think there's a chance that, you know, that would, a lot of people were calling this uh, a head and shoulders right here, right? Well, it's no head and shoulders, even if it's good and we have another rally left in it. The head and shoulders is gone. Uh, everything's going to hang on the dollar, buddy. The euro doesn't recover and starts closing under 1680. Uh, there could be a good shot for another new low coming here in silver. Hope that helps. I'm going to save a euro Aussie and those crosses for Blake and Steve. Good morning, Blake. How are you holding up in the monsoons? Oh, it's nasty, Dale. It's just nasty. I got it's thunder so here this morning. Huh? thunder here this morning oh yeah we got we got all the storms and it's um I, it was raining like cats and dogs yesterday which uh you know i mean it, it uh we ha we went from like a hundred and i don't know it's like 110 and humid you know it's like florida yeah. it felt like uh, worse yeah. than florida <laughs> it's, it's like you felt like you're in the armpit of whatever and then yeah. uh then, then yeah the 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 front came through and it was probably like 75 80 degrees uh, and now it's just back to hot and humid. It's, you know, 90 yeah. and humid. It's just, it's gross. I mean, this is the yeah. grossest time of the year. I mean, there, there's no, there's no, 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 if and or buts about it. this is the time of the year, which, where you go, why am I even here? Why, uh, you know, <laughs> what I am I doing? You know, I, I asked myself both in Chicago and Arizona several times, uh, why did people settle here? <laughs> yeah, but you know, you know then 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 you the get air conditioning. Uh, they didn't even have air conditioning. Yeah, in the then, older days. And then then you hear that the other you know, seven eight months out of the year, that's just it's it's, it's gorgeous. Beautiful. I mean, I, I look, I, we we have a convertible, uh, as one of our vehicles, and the yeah. the top is down the whole winter. I mean, you know, and right. you can't say that about most places. I mean, you really can't. You have to deal with a few months of gross weather, but. You know, uh, the rest of the year is great. There's not a lot of bugs. It's you know, it's it's uh, crisp and clean and nice. It's just it's it's these uh, couple months that are really really gross. But well, yeah, you know, know I, I used what? to just jump on uh, uh, the 17 or uh, Beeline Highway and head up north to escape it. You're an hour and a half uh, from beautiful mountains too. Yeah, we we have a family cabin that we go to, which is uh, which is which is nice and. Um, Where's it at? It's in Prescott. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, and I mean, the temperature is usually about 
20 to 25 degrees cooler, especially being in the woods. It's not in the valley, yeah. so it's actually in the woods. Um, so, so it is definitely cooler. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, enough about the weather. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about the market. So, as far as the um, as far as the, the the cable goes, you know, you know I got got a question about the the pound. Um, uh, Stelios uh, wrote a a really good blog post yesterday. If you guys didn't get an opportunity to read it, make sure you read it. It, it was uh, tweeted out yesterday, not only by myself. I think you tweeted it. I think um, yeah. the Forex Analytics account tweeted it. So. Make sure you you, you have a, a read. Um, I, I I'm I haven't bought the cable. I uh, I, I was long um, a couple of times. We had a pattern in play. I closed it out because I was a little unsure about the price action yesterday when we sliced through this uh, 132.50 level uh, yesterday. But uh, the cable, you know is is actually holding up relatively well. I was thinking about buying it this morning and I did not uh, yet. But uh, but but for all intents and purposes, we're holding some pretty decent support zones. Uh, I can I can actually just bring this down a little bit, and you can see just through you know all these you know spike lows, high high, you know low low, all these highs through here. This is a, a big support zone, and we're actually finding support through here. So, you know, while we're above trading above 132, I think the risk is for a higher pound. I, I and like I said, I haven't bought it. I, I, I don't own it, but I, I still take a look at the longer term, you know, view of the cable. And when I say longer term, you know, you can just scroll out to like this four hour. I have to, I have to take a step back when I see all this, this these intraday gyrations, I have to, you know, Taking into consideration, we did have a, um, let's go ahead and put this blue. We had a descending wedge. We broke out of the descending wedge. We completed a double top, right? And and so it's still constructive, even though I'm not long. Um, I feel like I should be long, but I'm, I'm not at the moment. Um, so if you're bearish, I'd be very careful. Like I said, I'm not long. I, I feel like I should be long. I'm just, I haven't found a, uh, a good placement for myself to be, be on the long side. I think if I would have uh, uh, been a, more, a little bit more diligent about, um, you know, trying to pick it up near the 132 level yesterday, I, 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 I you know, and I, I still feel that if we see some, you know, dollar strength come through the market, that might be the place to buy it. But I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't have that I don't feel like there's that opportunity that, that's, that's jumping out at me just yet. So, um, you know, if we can get a dip back to 132, I might might um, pick it up. But, you know, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to yawn on you. I, I really apologize. Um, but looking at the looking at the euro dollar, so the euro dollar, you know, broke the the uh, or um, uh, stalled at the 78% retracement. We actually broke the 117.20 level, broke some. Uh, a little minor support, but we're already getting a lift, and that's following the the the, the weak, um, you know, German ZEW numbers that came out overnight. Uh, but the euro, frankly, still looks fairly constructive as well. I, I I don't, I I would be a little nervous about being short the euro dollar at this point. I think the euro dollar, like I said, I think it still looks a little stronger. I personally will do better if the euro weakens and the dollar strengthens and the reason why I say that is because I am long the dollar Canadian uh, if you watch the week ahead video I was looking for a move to 130.50 I started buying it yesterday at 131 um, or excuse me 130.75 picked up more at 65 and I'm uh, I, I'm not long a full position because I wanted to be long more if we hit 130.50 but uh, if you if you uh, use Forex analytics, then you know that I put in a pattern in play yesterday as well because, you know, I'm playing against this longer term trend line, big breakout point uh, on a weekly basis, um, the pullback to this breakout point here, longer term trend line. And so I, I'm, I'm, I established a long position and I plan on holding it through the Bank of Canada if we are somewhere around here 
going into tomorrow. So uh, I think we can, you know, rally all the way back up to 132. I think we can pull back below 131. But I, I'd prefer to see us around these levels tomorrow if I'm going to stay on the long side of the U.S. dollar Canadian. I have obviously I haven't made that decision yet um, because that's not until tomorrow. But I do feel that, uh, y y you know, people have been buying the Canadian dollar ahead of the Bank of Canada and 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 so now you're starting to see that um, that uh, uh, you know maybe shoring up of some position some position squaring ahead of the Bank of Canada so that uh, you know like I said I've picked up the dollar Canadian I like it on the long side and um, and and you know I, I, I still think it plays up towards 133 to 134 um, tomorrow if if the Bank of Canada is a little bit more uh, neutral now one of the things that does make me a little nervous about the Canadian currency if you look at the COT data from Friday um, short positions continued to mount last up until last Tuesday in the dollar Canadian now one of the one of the things that you, some of those positions might have been squared up towards the end of the week because you saw the the breakdown below the 131.20 uh, level last week so that might have stopped out a few of the traders who were position, positioning themselves short early on which was reported in the cot data you might have gotten uh, some of those out uh shaken out a little bit over the last couple of days but uh, overall I, I still like to be on the long side of the dollar canadian knowing that you know longer term uh, this dollar Canadian looks like we're going up towards 140. So, but and and this this is obviously worrisome uh, if you're short the dollar because it, you know if the dollar Canadian is true, like let's say I'm right here in the dollar Canadian and we are going higher. Where does where does that put the euro dollar? Where does that put the cable? Um, and so, like I said, I, I I'm thinking about buying the pound. I, I haven't bought it. It may maybe the better better position here is being long the pound Canadian um, uh, which you know you can see the the 200 day moving average here um, is is really well supporting the 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 pound Canadian so I think a move back back above 180 I think is doable but there, there would have to be something NAFTA related trade related that would actually put the dollar the dollar Canadian up at those levels or the pound Canadian up at those levels I would think um, but that that might be a decent play. I'm not long the pound Canadian. That's just something that I'm, you know, it's kind of on my radar, if you will. Uh, the Aussie dollar, you know, we we had this double top um, started playing out yesterday, and you can see the double top actually should extend to 74 and a quarter. But we're already starting to see some some firmness, if you will, of the uh, of the of the Aussie dollar. Um, uh, you know, as we as we um, uh, are coming in a North American session, the Kiwi as well. The Kiwi is pulled back towards the neckline. Uh, actually, I could probably be a little bit better about drawing this neckline here. And and you know, the Kiwi should find some support around here. Maybe this was it. Maybe that was that was the low. Um, I, I I actually I don't want to totally talk about um, things other than the dollar currencies, but I do have to mention gold. If you guys are trading gold, um, I just went long, by the way. And uh, let me read you the analysis from yesterday, basic technical analysis in gold. Okay. And this is from yesterday. Gold could push back towards the 1250 level as stops above the last week's resistance was hit, then reversed. However, the 1250 level may offer a good risk reward for longs. It says Fort Longs, but that's my bad typing because uh, I because I wrote that yesterday evening um, then today we dropped below the 1250 level and we were taking out some stops and I said uh, gold has taken out stops below 1250 level which may be a setup for longs intraday soon and uh, I, I bought some gold when we were trading below uh, 1250 and as you can see we're trading at 1251 right now so um, we broke below the, this low took out took out a bunch of stops and now we're starting to reverse now the reason why I want to be long gold is because a and I'll go talk about the yen here in a second but 
um, we're, we're at the, this big multi-year trend line. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it does come all the way down to, you know, 1243, 1242, somewhere around there, maybe 1245, some, somewhere down here. Uh, and and I still feel that, that gold is, you know, as long as we trade above this 1240 level or 1238 level, you want to be long down here. The risk reward is still skewed to the uh, to the long side. Now, when when I talk about risk reward, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to be right. I, I I always try to point that out to people is that I, I'm not always right. And if anybody you know says that they are always right or close to always right, they're absolutely wrong. Um, this is not it's not realistic. Okay, but if if I'm buying down here and my risk is here, okay, so you know, let's call that risk being one. And where's my reward? Well, maybe back up to 1300. Well, if I risk one, I'm looking to make probably about four, right? That's a, a good risk reward. Any which way you slice it, I, I would take that trade every day of the week, all the time, N not even thinking about the 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 other you know the 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 macro point of view or the, the the fundamental point of view of whatever I'm trading if I if I have a risk reward of one to four I'm gonna take it you know uh, and that that's it but now now talking about gold just in general what why could what what's the other mounting evidence why we could you know bounce at these levels well if you look at the dollar yen the dollar yen is trading at a multi-year trend line here right here, let's, uh, let's I got a little bit of a mess going on here so let me let me get rid of that okay the dollar yen now depending on how you draw this trend line you can draw it right up against the, the the spike highs okay which will take us to about right here which comes in around you know 1150 or so or you know it, it, it I had it drawn a little bit earlier maybe draw through the wicks which would take us about where we're at right now maybe slightly lower but somewhere around this 11150 or spike high from from you know uh, back here in May it's it's all right around here okay so if the dollar yen does stop at this multi-year trend line and it starts to reverse yen and gold have very a very uh, 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 correlated um, relationship. So if gold indeed does bounce from 1250, which you know obviously we, we went as low as 1247.70 or something, whatever we did in gold, uh, and we're already back above 151. If if gold starts to rally, that may play into yen strength, which would be dollar yen weakness, which it's right up against resistance. So not only do I have like all these technical levels lining up in gold, um, but I've got correlated assets with with very similar setups so that those correlations may play very well into, you know, the trades that I'm taking. So again, it, this isn't just necessarily a gold play, although I do think that Gold is a decent long down here. That's why I'm long. But also the dollar yen may be a great short um, as gold is near a lot of support if you want to think of it in that, that way too, all right, which I am short the dollar yen, by the way, all right. So these are just, you know, a few things that I'm thinking of and I'm, and I'm trading today. Now, uh, a couple other things that we should probably talk about. Um, uh, let's go over to the US dollar Norwegian krona. That, that's finding support right at this head and shoulder, uh, head and shoulder neckline. But if the dollar, you know, really starts to break lower, the, if we break through this 797 level in the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona, that could be quite bearish event for uh, for the for the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona. Uh, and and like I, I was just explaining to you guys on the dollar yen, the dollar yen it may be firmer, but I, l l let me let me put something else up here really quick. Do I have it on this chart? Uh, Blake, Blake, can I just add one thing before you? No, leave? you can't. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. Hey, Stelius. Yeah, what's up? Hey, I, I just wanted to add that we had, in case people missed it, we had the Norway CPI today came in at 2.6% year on year, expected 2.4%, where it was still above target. So I was actually expecting dollar Norway to finally break below eight. It didn't. 
I'm still short, but very frustrated with it, but I'm, I'm keeping it. And I think that probably has more to do with, um, you know, dollar, dro dollar cross movements at the moment, right? I mean, yeah. the dollar the dollars just bid um, against a lot of different currencies, so that's that's probably the reason why I would assume. Yeah, very right. Likely. Yeah, it, it'll take out that base, Stell. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> Thanks, Stellios. We are. It's taking it's taking its time, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, you'd need the patience of Job for this formation here. Yeah, you know who Job was? I don't. Oh, yeah, he was a guy that uh, everything terrible happened to him, and he had patience and didn't lose his faith. Old Testament story. He was oh, tested. Yeah, okay. Job. Job. Yeah. yeah. Unlike okay. Lazarus, which is what I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got to tell you guys a funny story. So I, I went to get, I, I, you know, I, I got married in Greece. Um now, I, I don't come from a religious family. I am my, uh, I'm sorry, the dollar Canadians trying to break higher at a new highs here, yeah. which I'm happy about. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, grow up in a religious family. So when I was going to get married in Greece, I had to be baptized Greek Orthodox in order to get married in in Greece. Uh, so I went to the Greek Orthodox Church in Dallas, and you know the priest was like, uh, you know, he's like, you know, I. I and I actually ended up going church for, for a couple of years. And, I, and by the way, it was a great community. I, I, I loved going to that church. We went for years following um, while we were in Dallas uh, with my God family. Anyway, so I'm, I'm meeting with the priest for the very first time. And he's like, okay, so you want to get married in Greece. You got to be baptized, you know, but, you know, we want to make sure that you're, you go to church quite a bit and, uh, you, you know, and, and you, you attend service and be part of our community and, you know, everything else. And we were talking, and he goes, uh, he goes, um, he goes, oh, when, you know, what what month were you born? I was, I was like, well, I was born in, I was born in August, you know, whatever. And he goes, oh, me too. I said, oh, you're a Leo. <laughs> he goes, no, we don't believe in that here. I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that just shows you the. Uh, the I have a better one when I was a bachelor. of myself. What? Huh? When I, when I was a bachelor, I have a better one. I was sitting there eating, and some uh, woman approached me, and she said, what's your sign? And I said, stop. Stop sign. <laughs> How'd that work for you? I bet you huh? she picked up well, her I picked got up her and left. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, that was the whole purpose, you see. She got it. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Oh, that's funny. God, I never turned down a I never turned down a woman at a bar. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, uh, busy, so yeah. enough about that. Uh, Steve should be here. Thank God. Get me out of here. Uh, oh, thank yeah. God for the World Cup today, huh? Steve. So, so, so yeah, yeah. So this Wait, is, which 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 match do we have today, Steve? We have um, France with Belgium. Actually, uh, you know, uh, the, the best of the two semifinals, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so my uh, my 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 uh, father-in-law, who's Greek and he used to play for the Greek national soccer soccer team, football team, excuse me, years years ago. He's 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 he thinks Belgium's the dark horse. So it might be the case. Both teams are very strong. Um, what time? In uh, six and a half hours exactly from now. Eleven o'clock our time, okay. Dale. Okay, thank you. Yep. Good. So anyway, should be should be an exciting day for 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 football, even though we call it soccer. Um, but uh, but the FX market, I'm I'm assuming is going to die down here in a couple hours. But uh, we oh, are seeing for some me. volatility. Yeah, we are so far. I mean, we, we, we are getting some, uh, you know, uh, an attempt from the dollar to react. I think that, you know, this is actually happening at interesting levels. Um, in, you know, EURUSD is trying to uh, post an evening star formation uh, right on resistance. Uh, cable uh, has managed to hold above 133. So I do think that, you know, um, we, we, we need to see more evidence uh, before we call this, uh, you know, the you know, we, before we call the continuation of the dollar weakness we had uh, last week. Um, now, uh, having to do with um, the game, as you said, I do believe that volatility is going to try down the closer we, we get to the game. 
but until then, uh, you know, we might have some more uh, um, action. What do you think about stocks, though, Blake? Blake? Uh, they're strong. Um, you know, I mean, look, we're past, you know, everybody's shorted ahead of uh, the the tariffs. It ended up, you know, the market ended up shaking it off. So that's, I would assume, what caused the squeeze, you know, last Friday going into, you know, today. Um, you know, there, there's probably a lot of, uh, a lot of funds that are, underperforming still that have to chase the market higher um, so I don't see any reason why the stock market can't go higher I don't know if it will go higher I, I think that you know this this S&P um, false breakout that we're setting up today is a little scary especially after such a big rally into resistance uh, I think that I would I wouldn't want to be long I can see the reasons why the market's going higher I wouldn't want to be long here let, let me just put it that way. And and um, and the Nasdaq, you know, is not making uh, a, a new high. The Nasdaq 100 here, uh, the S&P, like I said, if we close lower today, this is going to set up as a false breakout above the recent highs. Uh, and the S&P is underperforming the rest of the, you know, the, the Nasdaq at this at this point. So um, I don't know. I I, I think the market. I I, I wouldn't want to be long. But I see the reasons why it's going higher. Like I know why it went higher over the last couple of you know days. Is as, as silly way, as it know, is. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, actually cryptos are getting massacred today. Very no, I actually didn't even, didn't even take a look at. I, I, tip, I tend not to. I look at them like usually once a day, and you know, aside from doing analysis, like usually, you know, when I'm completely bored and I'm like, okay, you know, what are cryptos doing? But no, they are getting uh, they're getting worked. Yeah, Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. Is, really not looking good um, because you know if, if ethereum you know cracks this 400 level it yeah can, it's going to be ugly yeah i think it's it's going to go to 250 uh, below below 400 actually yeah and and you know what um the the, the if or when you know ethereum uh, makes it down to the 100 200 dollar level i mean i may i may be opening up a a, a coinbase account or something soon and 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 you know, taking you know some money and putting it in the cryptos to put it away, uh, because you yeah, don't know. I if want to do that too. Yeah, I you don't do know. If, there, there's there's so much money behind cryptocurrencies, whether you believe in it or not. Um, it's it it it. it I, would, I I sure would want to. I sure would hate to be the guy that missed the internet. Because yeah. I, I participated in in the internet uh, yeah. uh, uh, growth in, back in the late '90s and early 2000s. It was that was your breakout, what, wasn't it? It's what made, it's what made, yeah, it's what made me. I I would sure like I would sure hate to miss another right, opportunity yeah. if it arises. I'm not yeah. saying that this is the end all be all, but maybe it is. I don't I don't know. You know, maybe fiat currency ends up going away. I, I you know, but I'd like to see some lower levels first. And then I might yeah, put buying some eighty percent discount. Uh, you know what's what's wrong with that? Well, you know it could end up being a hundred percent discount. So um, <laughs> exactly. Know, yeah, yeah. But, but but at the same time, you know, it, you know, I don't know if I could really face my kids twenty years from now and they go, well, Dad, why didn't you, you know, uh, look at cryptocurrencies? This is how everybody's using money nowadays. How 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 come you didn't? You know, you're in the markets. How did you not see it? So. Uh, again, I don't. I, I, you know, I don't. They cancel don't. their subscription with you as father. Right. You know. <laughs> I, but, but I. I don't. I think this is. I think these levels are doable down here. You know. I. I don't. I don't think that this would be. You know, a place where we 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 can go. And and like I said, for me, it's. You know, I park a little bit of money that that if I lose it, I lose it. If I don't, I don't. You know, it, 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 but it you know be for more for my kids, not for myself, not as a you trade. You know how to put it investment. in a wallet, Blake? Do you know what? how to do the mechanics of getting a wallet and yeah, I got to go through the whole process. It's just such a pain. I asked ass. I asked our guest yesterday if it was possible for yuppies like me if they I could get a leather bound wallet. That I'd feel more comfortable with, because they're just a. <laughs> Dude, huh? just put it on a hard drive and then stick it in your back pocket, and yeah, you'll be, 
you hate to lose yeah, it. And make and make sure make sure you don't throw it in the in the garbage can because yeah, you remember. That's right. Yeah. If you remember like, the stories about people that you know was were once involved with Bitcoin like very 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 initially, and then oh. they completely abandoned the whole thing. And when it started picking up in price, they started uh, like trying to dig in, um, you know, garbage burial uh, places, etc. Because you know they had what was worth like millions of Bitcoin, and they were trying to find uh, the thrown away hard disks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, hey. Um, All right, right buddy. Uh, Pass it on to you all. Uh, have a great one and um, and happy and go and go France. Sorry, I had to say it. Je suis fromage. All right, see you guys. <laughs> all right, see you later, Blake. You know what that means, Steve? No, uh, I, I I speak uh, you know English, German, oh, okay. and Greek. That's it. <laughs> Je suis fromage means I am cheese. <laughs> <laughs> So, Steve, I wanted to ask you, I was thinking about uh, the Russell, and when you came up with that 170, 180, 172 level, was that off the IWM or off the Russell, because there's some price differentials I, between the two? IWM, IWM. Okay. Thank you, buddy. It is. Got it. It is. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we are trying to, yeah, we're trying I'm gonna to use, make it. A... Yeah, I'm going to key on uh, that level for doing something in uh, bearish ETFs yeah, when let's, we get there. Let, let's see, because yeah, we, if we, we, get might, there. We, might, we might actually make it there. I mean, we, we're just a couple of two, three days of yeah. uh, bullish transaction away from that. Uh, but yeah, to, right to into honest, the summit with Putin. <laughs> um, so uh, having to do with risk, since, since you brought the conversation there, having to do with risk, you know, uh, NASDAQ is, is testing the previous highs. But you know that that goes well with our plan. Uh, you know our plan. That's right. You had it up there, seventy-four thirty. See another bound, perhaps. Yeah. So you know, uh, we we might be looking at the, let's put some more extensions. We might be looking, um, we might be looking at a bigger, at the larger ascending wedge here. So we might make it all the way up to seven thousand five hundred fifty-eight, or at least seven thousand four hundred thirty-one, the one twenty-seven point two, or the one forty-one point four extensions uh, before we see another leg lower. Uh, now, having to do with the S&P, since we broke above this uh, trend line, I think that we need to respect the upside as long as this trend line is holding. As I had said, you know, I was not being persuaded by, uh, you know, all the bearish scenarios unless we cleared 2,690, 2,690 held like a champ. Yeah, you're so, exactly spot on. Yeah, so, uh, you know, as long as that level is holding and uh, especially now that we've broken above it as long as this descending trend line is holding, I really wouldn't be uh, bearish one way or another, right? So we, you know, we need to respect the trend. We need to respect the fact that perhaps, perhaps this was the correction and the correction is over since some time ago. Uh, so there is a chance that, you know, what we're seeing here is already like the second leg higher in uh you know the the new um push uh, after seeing this uh, corrective move so there is a good chance that we're going to you know head all the way to new highs and we need to respect that uh, possibility simply because this is a multi year uptrend and you know as simple as that multi year up cleaning out stops over 2800 which it's where we peaked at, you know, uh, uh, that high that we had after the first break that we never got to uh, before this decline. Clean out the bears over 2,800, you know, whatever the number goes to, and okay. then have still have a C wave because it's still not absolutely um, a higher, absolutely can, higher high. Absolutely can happen. Absolutely can happen. And you know, somebody can claim that this big corrective move lower in 2015 almost made the same thing like we had a sharp leg lower right yeah yeah we then started recovering the recovery then started getting more aggressive uh, i remember very well that a lot of people were persuaded up here that yeah. you know that was it the correction was over and we were heading to new highs and then we got another sharp leg lower right yeah. and then when people started getting bearish down right. here this yeah. is when the uptrend resumed so can what you say happen? Uh, yeah, absolutely it can. But on the other hand, we have to be fair. 
how many times during this multi-year uptrend have people uh, said, okay, perhaps we're going to break the previous high and this is going to be a fake move and then we're going to turn lower and everybody's going to be trapped being bullish and the index is going to collapse. How many, yeah, how many we times? You were right. Uh, I did a couple times. Yeah, and the vast majority of the people have done that a couple of dozen times. A couple of right? million times. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, bottom line being is that you know, uh, you, statistically speaking, you always have to begin by acknowledging and respecting the trend, which, as far as we know, remains a bullish one. Now, as you said, we had the precedents. That's why I showed it to you because I have that in mind of 2015 that people got trapped that you know, the correction was over, then we had another leg lower, then people started getting pessimistic, then we actually got the resumption of the uptrend. So can this happen again? Yes, it can. But, you know, that's why I'm still looking one level at a time. When we were, you know, moving lower, I said 26.90. Unless this breaks, I'm not persuaded that I should be short. Um, now we broke above this level. As long as we remain above that level, I'm not going to be persuaded to be short once again. So... Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's what I think. Now, having to do with the DAX, for example, DAX tested today this area of resistance we we're talking about, getting rejected so far, uh, as long as 26, uh, sorry, 12,600 remains, uh, you know, resistance and holds, um, I, I think that, you know, th there is still a chance that we might see another leg to the downside. Now, uh, having to do with the FTSE, though, be careful because the FTSE is likely breaking higher. We were talking about this um, textbook corrective uh, channel yesterday. Um, and I do think this constitutes uh, like a bullish development. I do think that the FTSE presents a good opportunity of being long uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, I, it would be my preferred um, index to, to be long at the moment. It's the one I have less hesitations for in comparison to, to others. Okay. Now. Having to do with the Nikkei, you know, I need, I need to stress out here that uh, the fact that we got no continuation after breaking be below 22,000, definitely this double top target, which was at 21,000, did not get fulfilled. And we're seeing like a big reversal higher. This obviously skews uh, somewhat the technical picture here. Um, still, I think that, uh, you know, in order for me to, to turn bullish, I would still need to see a break above 23,000. As long as that doesn't happen, I'm, I'm really not uh, convinced or I, I wouldn't want to be um, involved with that. One thing is for sure, and I wrote it in the weekend analysis as well, that having to do with the USD yen, things are quite simple here. We have a confluence of resistances at 111.50. Why? Because 111.50 has been several times support resistance in the past, and most importantly, from 111.50, we have this descending trend line that has tested, has been tested multiple times and has held so far. I do think that a break above this trend line, uh, especially if confirmed uh, on a daily and even better on a weekly closing basis, is going to be a major event and will probably open up uh, a lot more upside for the USD yen. So. I do think that we're getting close to the point of, uh, you know, getting some kind of an event here. Either that's going to be like a big rejection from this confluence of resistances, or it's going to be a breakthrough this confluence of resistances. Uh, one way or another, we're going to know quite soon. I definitely don't want to be involved with the USD yen uh, as long as it's so close at resistance. I'm not convinced that it's going to be moving lower because I don't see the structure. From a risk-reward perspective, obviously, shorting here because you know where you're going to be wrong makes sense. So I would definitely not uh, blame anybody for wanting to be short uh, and taking uh, like a, you know, a chance and risking little to perhaps make more. Personally, I've stayed away from this pair because it's, it's been trading very strangely. It's unfazed in the vast majority of the days. We've even seen it lately trade um, uh, oppositely, 
than risk on occasion, oppositely than the other the rest of the USD pairs do. So I do think that this FX pair is, you know, somewhat or at the big extent manipulated. So I'd rather stay sidelined until at, at least I see it make uh, some kind of a big um, uh, move or anyhow break some kind of a big level as this one is. So, so far I haven't been involved in a long time and I don't in, in, intend to get involved unless, as I said, we get a big rejection or a big push through and follow through after that. In which case I will then have a stronger bias of what's about to happen there. Right now, having to do with what I said before, listen, I was mentioning yesterday, uh, we were talking together, Dale, and I told you that, listen, let's wait to see how the day closes, because at that point when we had the webinar yesterday, both the EURUSD uh, was trading above this descending trend line, and the cable at that point was trading above this horizontal resistance area at 133. Now, both of them actually managed to close the day lower and they still remain lower in fact just a while ago the euro usd was at the lows of the day threatening to post an evening star formation right on the triple confluence of resistances because actually this is a triple confluence of resistances let me zoom in so you can see it it's the 23.6 from the uh february high to the lows it's the 50 dma that's there and it's also this descending trend line resistance so I do think that there is a nice chance to, to, to have some follow through in the F side in the Euro USD, but if and only if we do uh, finally clear this 117.50 area and actually manage to hold um, above it. So until that happens, I have to remain uh, skeptical and the same thing applies with uh, the cable as long as it remains below 133. It has already broken above a descending trend line, uh, sorry, a descending wedge, which is definitely uh, you know, a first step but I also want to see it clear this horizontal area of resistance. The same thing applies with the Aussie and the Kiwi. Why? Because uh, I actually covered the Aussie twice yesterday because we had a question later on and I said that, listen, a very nice rebound so far, but unless we clear the 75 cent area, uh, which is like a double confluence of uh, resistances, the 50 DMA is there, it's also horizontal support resistance area, you know, I cannot get enthusiastic for the upside. So, so, so far, this level is holding. And, you know, as long as it does, uh, you know, I cannot jump the gun. Same here with the Kiwi. Kiwi posted an inverted head and shoulders formation on the four hour chart. You can clearly see it here, but you can see it if we go to the four hour chart. Here it is. Um, so, an inverted head and shoulders formation. Um, but, um, you know, I would still want to see a break above uh 06880 to begin with we haven't seen that yet okay so um i think we need to be a little bit more patient and give it a little a few more days to see in fact what the dollar wants to do as you see the dollar is rebounding uh from here from the 50 dma it ha it didn't reach actually the 9340 resistance now we need to see what kind of a rebound that's going to be obviously so far we're attempting to uh, form a, a morning star formation on the dxy if the dxy closes near the highs today that's going to be quite a bullish signal now if by the end of the day it has more or less failed and closes uh you know just being positive and not at the highs of the day or whatever this might have been just a short term rebound and we might see one more leg to the downside so I said yesterday as well that uh, I believe that we're going to probably need a couple of two, three days to get more clarity having to do with what's happening with the dollar. And that's absolutely fine because as long as you know what kind of levels you, you want to monitor and what kind of levels you want to see, you know, to get a uh, bigger conviction, it's fine to, to wait for them. Um, now, let me, uh, by the way, you already showed USD knock and I want to show USD sec as well. First of all, I have to say that the fact, you know, Blake said that uh, USD knock is rebounding from this neckline. Keep in mind, this is a triple confluence of supports, right? Why? It's not only the neckline of head, head, head and shoulders formation, it's a horizontal uh, area of support. It's also the 200 daily moving average that's in there. Here it is, the blue one, right? So triple confluence of supports. Uh, as Taylor said, Norwegian CPI beat. Norwegian CPI is very high. Norwegian CPI is at 2.6%. And you know, under normal circumstances, 
having expected 2.4, which is anyhow above target, and seeing 2.6 should have led to a big uh, appreciation of the Norwegian krona. And you know, regardless of um, if the dollar is bid or not bid against other pairs, USD NOC should have uh, made a decent move to the downside, which it hasn't. And that actually worries me because, you know, what happens when you see a market not reacting as as it should be reacting to news? So what 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 can you tell about a market that should uh, react to in in this case bearish news because you know the news were uh, like bullish the knock so bearish the USD knock. So what happens to a market that it doesn't respond in a bearish manner to bearish news? Usually not a good sign, right? Regardless, eight remains the line in the sand, uh, and the daily close below it is going to be needed to trigger this formation. Until that happens, the only thing somebody can say is that the pair is currently uh, on support. So, you know, selling it right as it's bouncing off support after a news that should have helped it actually penetrate through it doesn't seem like a good idea to me. So, if you were short from higher sure perfect but you know sorting it here doesn't make much sense let's have a look at the usd sec usd sec as you see is trying to post the morning star formation exactly at confluence of supports so you have to keep that in mind obviously same thing applies here this is not the place to be shorting usd sec because it's actually trying to rebound from supports now if it actually manages to break through that I do think that we're headed to 850 next, uh, and you know then you can be thinking about uh, sorting it and looking for the next downside target. Now let me see what questions we have after big uh, treasuries. Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a look at treasuries. And actually, we haven't had that. We haven't done that in some time. Let's have a look at both the boons and the treasuries. So boons. Big picture, multi-year uptrend, multi-year uptrend, consolidating in a triangle uh, uh, since two years ago, right? Descending triangle, um, and as you see, oscillating from resistance to support, and it has been doing that for two years. Bottom line, I think that the closer we get to this triangle's resistance, the uh worse idea it is to try to actually uh buy them in essence i i also believe that they're losing momentum in the short term here so it wouldn't surprise me if i saw another move lower right so i do think that getting involved with the boons you know selling up here for short term for short term move is a better idea obviously than buying but i do think that getting involved right here uh you know doesn't make much sense if you want to, uh, you know, uh, hold uh, in some way. Now, having to do with uh, treasuries, if we look at the daily, there was an obvious potential for a flat top triangle, the same thing that others call an ascending triangle, which is like a bullish formation, because you expect that if this uh, flat top is taken out, then the move higher should extend. And that's exactly what I initially expected when I was predicting that we would rebound again from this descending wedges resistance. We did get the rebound. We got then a formation that looked like it could break to the upside and give us one more leg higher. But what we're getting instead is this, which this is the four hour chart now. It's the same thing on a four hour chart, right? Which admittedly doesn't look that bullish because we broke higher from that potential flat top. We proved that the wedge interpretation was probably the correct one. And now we're dripping lower. Uh, so, you know, if we see some kind of an acceleration, I do think that we're going to be heading to, heading to new lows. Regardless, um, I think that 119.26 which uh you know because um if you want to make it in uh you know if you want to whoop 
there it is. Uh, so it's 119.8 in essence. Um, is going to be support. As long as we stay above there, of course, there is another chance that we're going to push higher. But especially if we break below there, I do think that uh, you know the treasuries are going to be uh, posting new lows. So I think they're quite in danger. Um, I'm closely monitoring, uh, regardless. Did we get any news? No. Okay. Um, so uh, let me see what other questions we have. Dale, do we have an interview today, by the way? Nifty, you're asking about the Nifty. Let's have a look at it. We have uh, Peter Goodburn today, Steve, so this is going to be a good good interview, I think. Okay, nice. Um, okay, you're asking about the Nifty. I, 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 I told you my opinion about the Nifty several times ago. This is a triangle. I think this is... Uh, you know, this is a bullish breakout that's happening. and you know, you have to respect it. I think that the chances for a new high are high, <laughs> right? I mean, we corrected lower, we moved higher, we consolidated in a triangle, we're pushing higher once again. I don't see anything bearish with Nifty yet. So, you know, I, I would be bullish after this breakout. Uh, you can never know 100% sure if it's a fake breakout or not, uh, Niraz, but doesn't look like it. I mean, I think it has decent chances of producing follow through. I think it has more chances of producing follow through than anything else, if that's what you're asking me. Why? Because the whole structure and price action seems consistent, right? Push higher, triangle, another push higher. So, yeah, the chances of being a fake breakout are always there, but I don't think they're very high. I mean, there are less than 50% chances, if that's what you're asking me. Gold and silver, let's have a look at them. Um, obviously, we're getting a pullback in, in the vast majority of the metals, but look at the price action today. Silver at some point was testing levels lower than yesterday's lows, and it's getting bid once again, right? So as it seems, there is some kind of a bid for the metals. Same thing with gold. I do think that if we see a daily close above 1260, then gold is going to extend higher towards at least this descending channel's resistance. So, bottom line, we already seen that happen, so we can take it away. Close above 1260, I think that we're headed at least towards, let's say, 1275, this descending channel's resistance. And if we do break afterwards that one, then we can be talking or looking for more bullish targets. Until 1260 breaks, you have to respect the downtrend and the potential that gold is going to resume to the downside. So let me be very clear. Only a daily close above 1260 starts opening up upside targets. Until that happens, you have to respect the downtrend trend as and, and, and you know the, the, the potential for more weakness uh, as the higher probability um, direction, right? So that's it. It's as simple as that. Uh, uh, demand is lower half. Yes, a uh, USD TRY. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Obviously, the USD Turkish Lira is not very happy with Erdogan being re-elected and you know doing his stuff. And what do you see here? Yep, we had already drawn that, you know, since then. Uh, it's a triangle, and what he do you do? He made a son vice president. Yeah. Uh, so what like do Jared triangles Kushner. do? <laughs> yeah. So what what do triangles do, uh, <laughs> Dale? All these. Yeah. They, they usually uh, break in the direction of the trend. Yeah. 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 So what do we expect? If that's a four, but it, it could be. It, it could be. But out. what? Yeah. But bottom line, but if you're it, asking yeah. me what I think is going to happen. I think that yeah. the Turkish Lira is going to test the five handle. Okay. By the way, I was looking at it some time ago. Ten-year, uh, ten-year uh, Turkish bonds yield how much, Dale? Give me an estimation. Eight uh, percent. Yeah, you're almost there. Almost eighteen percent. Seventeen point seven percent. Oh wow. Is wow. the yield on 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 the ten-year uh, Turkish bond? 
So good what's luck. It back, uh, what's it backed by? Hash? <laughs> Steve, Steve, you buy you buy you buy ten year Turkish bonds to get eighteen percent yield, and you lose that in a month in the currency, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that can. I mean, I honestly believe, Stelio, that eighteen percent for the ten year uh, Turkish bonds it, it's, is it's, is yeah. stupidly low because not only you can suffer from further depreciation in what is one of the best established uptrends in the FX world at the moment, we're talking about a multi-year ruthless uptrend, but you invest in Turkish Lira, which not only suffers from depreciation, but what is the inflation rate currently in Turkey, Stelio? I don't know, but I'm guessing the high double digits. Even if they don't report high double digits, do you have any... Uh, <laughs> do you have any... Um, uh, you know, um, uh, hesitations that, you know, the unofficial one is going to be that, that high. I don't, personally. Well, it's not yeah. backed by gold, guys. It's backed by hashish. 15% uh, is the so answer. That appeal to. Yeah, 15%. So, actually, yeah. you, get, you get a real yield of 2.7%, right, Stelio? You get a, you a real carry all that risk associated, yeah. It's and you carry good. all that risk associated, which makes it, as I said, a very, very low return, if, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. Midnight Express, that's all okay. I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to watch it last week. I, could, I couldn't watch it. I turned it off. I, I had a panic attack. <laughs> anyway, Peter's here, guys. Okay, okay, enjoy the interview. See you all tomorrow. All right. And uh, enjoy all right, the game you. tonight. All right, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stell, Blake, Peter. I see you in here. So, uh, great to have you back, buddy. I'm going to make you the presenter. Look forward to our talks as I have through the years. Welcome back to Face, Pete. Right, so Carol, can you hit me? In, yeah, I can. I got you, buddy. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good, actually. Thanks. Um, it's nice to talk to you again. Yeah, you know, we've. Been, how many years do you think it's been, Peter? Three, four, uh, at yeah. least? Yeah, well, who's counting? But, yeah, something yeah. like that. I mean, um, yeah, we I mean, do time plus five. You do enough counting with your, your charts. <laughs> I count this, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, it's been it's been a few years now, but it's been great because um, you know, to be part of your organization has been really good to see what you're doing and and updating so professionally. And I have to say, Dale, you're really up there and I really appreciate you you contacting me because it's really great because we talk the same language, we we see things in the same way. We also have a you know, a good history of the markets, which is fun to go back to in time and seeing you know what we discovered and then and what we've learned since it's great great experience so thanks oh i uh you're very welcome peter and that that was a great segue because you know before we get to the charts here um i was uh interested in talking a little bit about what separates and distinguishes your your work you and your work which is synonymous from the multitudes of uh, Elliott Wave practitioners. You know, there's many, many out there, and, you know, some are good and some aren't as good. And, uh, you know, I, I can vouch for you being spot on so many times over the years. Is it um, the time that you put into your analysis, or is there any different twist that you use in your uh, wave counts that? Uh, most don't even know about or consider doing? Well, <clears throat> I think there's a combination of things. First of all, it is uh, it is certainly the amount of time you put in. I mean, I can see that, especially with uh, some of uh, my tutors, um, some of my pupils when I've taught um, Elliott Wave in the past. I mean, you, there's, a clear, there's a clear distinction between those who want to put in the time and those that don't really. But I think also, um, I have um, one, one tip for anybody that was doing that is doing Elliott Wave, and that is that um, go back to Elliott's original writings, uh, especially in Nature's Law, which was published in 1946. You get a feeling that 
um, his work was incomplete, but he was getting into this point where he was looking at symmetry, dimension, geometrics. Um, this is where Fibonacci overlays come in, of course, everybody in the FX world right. uh, knows about the use of Fibonacci stuff, but it goes a bit deeper. And if you start looking into what Eliot's initial works were about geometrical measurements and stuff like that, um, you then probably sort of um, start reading books about geometry, patterns in nature, all of these types of elements, and you begin to get a certain rhythm, an idea of how markets are, and are trying to evolve. One of the big um, setbacks for, for anybody trading Elliot or, or analyzing Elliot is the fact that also without this idea and concept of geometry, symmetry in the patterns, you're really left with distortion on several times you you know um you can be influenced by the news flows or you can be influenced by some ex other exogenous event or, or or sentiment situation and you will distort those patterns but if you work from this geometric principle idea um which elliot was touching on this on this you know on the sides of when he was in his last years of of working with this and developing his theory and refining it you'll get to a point where you look at the patterns, not from, you know, from distortions anymore, but looking from the symmetry point of view. And therefore, um, when you start measuring the patterns and their amplitudes, you will see that there's a, there's a high frequency recurrence event where, for example, a zigzag where waves A and C are geometrically measuring the same more often than not. Or there's a relationship between waves A and C through an extension type ratio approach, which I can, ex I can show you you know, for example, on this dollar index. Uh, okay. We, yeah, let's go. You know, to, let's go to the buck here. Yeah, you can see you can see my charts, right? And, yes. Um, Got them. I mean, if we if we just tick box thirty eight sixty one eight, and if we go up here to measure a zigzag completion, here's five ways up uh, into last month's high, and we just extend right. a couple of ratios. You're going to get um, two upside targets. Now, the thirty eight percent target for wave C of a zigzag is um is predicated on the depth of wave b it has to be at least 50 percent uh, if it's short if it's 38 percent or shorter um then we would naturally go up to the 61a area here um, and the main reason for that is because we're trying to geometrically ensure that um, we're not seeing a distortion in the measurement between waves a and c um, and you know this is very important. Um, there are there are of course always exceptions to a rule, no matter what you look at. But generally, Everything. if you keep yeah exactly, if you just keep to this concept of of playing out um, the repetition of these patterns and these measurements, you will get great amount of hits. And when you do see a little bit of divergence or deviation, it really brings your focus and attention into it. And then you can start working with uh, different degrees of trend at the same time, just to uh, see how malleable that trend deviation is occurring. And invariably, you'll be able to pick up the slack later. So um, I, I come from a perspective on Elliott Wave where customer drives um, your product. And um, a lot of our clients, most of them are institutional clients and, and um, they, you know, I have people in my books for the last 25 years and they're still with me. And, but they, they're very, you know, when you get to that point, you're, it's, you're, you're driven by success and results. And if you, if you make a mess of things and you don't get something right, you have to find the solution to why it went wrong. So there's a lot of um, introspection. There's a lot of um, feedback going back over a scenario. Why did you forecast it this way? Why did you forecast it that way? Um, would would you, there have been? Any... I, it might be a silly question, uh, but uh, do you actually journal those things? Do I do those? You things? know the things you do. You journal. You know, kind of like write down when a scenario did work out and what you didn't see uh, and that you look for next time or you just remember it you take a mental note no I do both actually okay I both. all right yeah I actually make notes and say well why why did that go wrong what was what was different then um, uh, I found also I think that's that... a great you know that's a great point I, you know and I want to just emphasize it mm. Peter you've been trading how you've been in these markets and doing this for how many years 
well, look, I, I dare say 40 years, but it has okay. been. Okay. And, yeah. and Peter still writes things down in journals and uh, goes over his work, reassesses. And so if someone who's been in the market for decades does it, it's probably a good idea for people that have been doing this for a few months, a few years to be in the habit of having that discipline so that you learn from your mistakes. And I just wanted to make that point that, you know, uh, a lot of us after many years, we just stop. And uh, so that's also something that I think uh, sets you apart is your um, your intensity for, uh, you know, it's your bread and butter. You have to get things right. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's motivation to do that. Obviously, if you're working alone, and I know, you know, many people are sitting sitting in their office or their desk and they're trading currencies or whatever. Um, it's very hard to keep up that uh, incentive. You know, you've got to, there've got to be some incentives to, you know, to to produce. And I would just say, look, Eve, it doesn't matter whether you're doing Elliott Wave or any other methodology, uh, as long as it works and makes you money, that's good. But if you, you know, invariably, you have a bit of a clangor, which I mean, you know, you have, you know, one of those times when you're giving back all your hard-earned money because you're over leveraged or you've got one particular, go back over that, have a good think, um, be retrospective, don't be afraid. I mean, it can be daunting to do that because you're facing, you're facing a loss. Nobody likes to have a loss and um, it feels bad, you feel sick. Um, but these are, these are things which to become a really, to be really efficient and to be, to be to getting those results consistently over time, you really have to be afraid of your darkest soul and you have to go into that and start examining what you were thinking at the time. And sometimes you forget, you know, um, if you're doing so many different things uh, or you've been distracted, you know, it's a good thing to note down why you went into a trade. In fact, I do that for my own trading. I always write down, why did I want to do it at that particular moment? Because invariably you sometimes go back and think, actually, I don't remember why now. I mean, you should know why every time. You know, but yeah. um, sometimes your your mind plays games, and yeah. you don't want to face the truth, so you you hide it from yourself. But if you if you write it down, well, you've got you've got nowhere to go but to to look at your own handwriting. Um, Great. Uh, but anyway, Great. yeah, it's an Great important step. aspect. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at the dollar here, Peter, and I. You know, I think as long as I've been talking to you. You've had a negative bias in it. And, you know, my, you're, you're answering my question here. I was going to ask you what you thought of this rally from 88 and a half to the recent high at 550. If mm. it was just uh, another bear market rally or there's more to it. And I could see from your count here um, that you're looking, depending upon, as you explained earlier, if it's a shallower correction, we could look for higher levels, a deeper mm -hmm. correction, not as high. Am I reading your work correctly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, again, it's good to go back over things and see what, what happened. I, I actually had a very good introspection with my own work because this chart I'm just putting up now was, was well, dated February 2nd, so it was pretty much at the lows. But I still thought there'd be one more twist down to 87.72 before before we got this. Yeah. I mean, I was looking at this. I thought, well, look, uh, we're missing a little fourth, and a, we need a little bit of a dink down to 87.72. Yeah. This was um, a 61.8 proportional ratio of the measurement of one to three, and I felt pretty comfortable with that. I, I actually even spread it out time-wise a little bit because um, I don't know if I got this. Oh, yeah, I was showing a client this earlier. This is my um, my uh, my own um, composite cycle, which I've developed uh, on a daily basis, that is. And the for those of, the, of you who aren't, aren't familiar with cycle work, um, the idea on a composite cycle, at least, especially when you overlay it like this, is not to project where the amplitude. This has got nothing to do with amplitude of price. I mean, if we're working with amplitude of price, we work with Elliott Wave for pattern. And price terms amplitudes we're working with food price ratios extensions and so forth so this is uh, more this like is, seasonal seasonal tendencies or just the the cycle of highs and lows how they how they run yes i mean this is not seasonal this is basically yeah. a composite of about five or six different cycle intervals which okay. I, I've, I've done manually i've gone back and looked over and seen 
what regularities are involved, if there's any uh, misdemeanors, but we've put them together in this software and then it produces a composite. But it's basically timing. You can see the timings here, the low here was pretty good. Here was a bit late, the cycle was late, and it was late here actually, but it did complete the thrust that we saw in May. And that's interesting because you'll often find here, look, here's the absolute high for the dollar index in January last year. But the cycle came later when the thrust developed. And that can often happen. Um, and it's happened here. So I thought when we did originally the a look at the dollar index, this was a bit of a consolidation. We get one more flick down and then it would start to push up. We had this cycle really you know, starting to accelerate. So we knew the dollar was coming. This is the going back to the February low right and we knew that some some pretty big upswings would develop and of course this is the reality since it it had a slightly lower low here but that was all that was that came through it was a very short fifth wave and i'm very interested in that because well, it seems, is that like a, they call that a truncated or a fifth wave failure well it's not it's not a, um, a truncation oh, it, it would have to finish above that oh, third wave I, low there and it was okay but it's, but it's very short you see Dale, that's yeah. pretty odd. And the same thing happened at the top here, actually, um, when when this peak developed. This fifth wave was was actually quite short, and um, and this one was short on the downside. And I got a bit wise uh, to that uh, last month because we're then counting five waves up here. And ordinarily, what we would do at this point would be to extend waves one to four by sixty one eight. And that would have come up somewhere up, up here, but um, I suddenly realised this was pushing the pushing the, uh, the 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 expectation a bit too far because ultimately this is only five waves. This is wave A of a zigzag, and if we're projecting wave C beyond such a point like that, it's going to go even way up here. It's not impossible, but you're just lessening the odds, the probability. So um, because these short fifth waves occurred up here and up here, I suddenly realised that we could have a short one in here. It was the only explanation, the only rational explanation for getting up to this 50% band, because if we measure fifth price ratios and put retracements levels in here, look, come down here, you'll see the 50% marker come in. Oh, yeah. And um, I think that 50% We were a little short of that with a double top kind of made me suspicious of this recent high. Uh, yeah. You know, that they, there was no stop, there was no cleansing of the high the move prior was a perfect double top to the pip so, yeah exactly uh, and it was it was nice i mean okay i mean it was pretty good to see that um you're i'm working with log scale charts you probably might have got the exact you know on, on our arithmetic chart that could happen sometimes but um okay. for me that was pretty satisfying to see um enough there i thought well the fifth, the fifth wave in this case is obviously it has to be short and and that's where we got to so you know when you look at um when you look at it now we are, we're in a regression phase down here and um, we have to you know, obviously see i think we're going to see some more dollar declines before this thing goes back up again um okay um yeah i think that's the, the general concept and it's the same for the euro inverted you know if you take a look at the euro right um we're looking at sort of getting up to the 50% retracement area before. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are talking that would be like a head and shoulders top formation. That would be a right shoulder there. This one, Compared like this. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's the neckline. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, um, yeah, so if this pops up here, you right. get the right shoulder and then down Pretty she comes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, the thing is that uh, with head and shoulders, of course, um, if you take that measurement and block it down, you'll get to probably somewhere down like that. Um, okay. So it would work out pretty well, I guess. Yeah, that would be All perfect. Right. Yeah. And that and that's the end of two. And then uh, we have the money wave coming uh, sometime next year is when the dollar uh, uh, starts to uh, fail again. That's right. Yeah. Well, when we let, let's have a look at the euro in a bigger scenario. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, here we go. Because you know, a lot of people are saying that you know we're going to challenge the lows from last year, the 103 lows, but uh, that's not what you're seeing here. Just a a big pullback, and look at that, 202. 
you're <laughs> yeah that's right okay. well we've got some yeah. yeah we've got some pretty long-term data here and we go back to um, the 1920s when the right oh was basically worthless so oh, you know I had, I had lunch I had lunch with Jesse <laughs> Livermore back then we were talking markets I had to pick up the tab because he was a little early but, <laughs> uh, anyway so wow I mean you know and, and this has been your view for as long as I've been talking to you that there can be you know a route of yeah dollar coming yeah. up yeah I mean, this this hasn't changed for oh, I can't remember when. I mean, um, I, let me just just to show you roughly what this looked like. Well, this is a this is, I just found an old chart from yesteryear. This guy I don't know. This is dated in in 2000, I think. And you can see that you know A B C X A B C, and and this was coming down in a zigzag. Oh, and this is yeah. ancient and. This is this is the X wave we've come up in any since. Um, actually, it's good also um, as a you know I keep all my charts, so I like to look through back to see what what we've done, and that's another good way of introspection, you know, so that you can see whether you're fooling yourself or not. Exactly. Um, yeah. But this hasn't changed really for a long time. Uh, this is the birth of the euro here. Okay. I never forget that because we had a really nice zigzag in there. You know, you can okay. do this measure these numbers down here um, but no this is going up this is going up a lot uh, I don't think we're going to go back yeah. to 103 who's saying one oh, below 103 then anybody, uh, anybody there some, yeah there's some people that are you know looking for it to take out 103 really? uh, before there's another low wow but, yeah wow. anyway you know that's what makes a market uh, yeah. I know that um, I recall a conversation with you and it's pretty timely I don't know if you prepared for it but I remember talking to you, it may have been over Skype or we were exchanging notes, and I remember you saying 75 in crude was going to be a, a sticky area, and uh, we're there now, so I'm wondering uh, uh, what the potential scenarios are from a level that you called a long time ago, uh, the $75 level, and uh, yeah. what your thoughts are. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the things which... Um, which was really fantastic on oil going back to the low we saw in February 16 was the fact that again this is um this is a really um, big effect you know because we're labeling this decline from the from the July 08 highs up here down here as a zigzag so this is you know and this is again another very good point you know you can't do this work if you're not in log scale by the way and you've also got to make sure that your fib price ratios your extension levels are set to log now, I, I got CKG. I'm using CKG, and I used I asked okay. them to put this uh, this in for me specifically because okay. if I if I untick this box for a minute, and uh, I'm choosing 100%, okay, and this is a log scale chart, but you watch what happens if I take 100% of this and pull this up to the top here. You can't even see my 100%. Actually, I have to move it up like this. Where is it? Oh, let it go. Hold on. Let's do that again. That's <laughs> yeah, in there. Yeah. So key point being log scale on your fib. Uh, oh, there, uh, there it is. Fib. It slides okay. down so low, I can't even see it. It's somewhere down. It's gone off the scale. It's like minus, uh, we it's, get paid yeah. to. Uh, we it's minus twenty. They pay us to fill up our car. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I'll put it. Yeah. I'll put it into um, linear scale. Maybe that's better. You can see it comes down to here. Look, if you take that hundred percent okay. value and subtract yeah. from there, you're getting into minus. Okay, so yeah. you can't do that. It's not not workable. So what you've got to do, and I've got to remember to put this tick box back in, is um, is just go down like this. And subtract from there, and that's where you're, that's where the C wave should finish. This is all, all about proportionality, which I was talking about earlier. And okay. um, you know, just because um, it happens, you shouldn't necessarily believe it. But basically, um, I'm just. So 75 um, doesn't look as sticky. You're looking for 78, 90, 87, 90. Yeah, well, before basically, before we what's... have any kind of decent correction again. Yeah, what we've got to do is again, we've got to extend. 
this initial swing up, which is primary wave A. Now, the orthodox top for primary wave A is here. So yeah. we extend that by 61.8, and that produces this projection line, which mm -hmm. is 78.90. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice that the B wave, the correction down, was actually what we call a running flat. It drops down wave A here. That's the low in August 16. Then it runs right. up three waves yeah. into February 17, then drops five down here. So sometimes what you can do is you can include the B wave of the correction to extend. I remember and, you liking the crude in the low 40s. Uh, yeah, so that was a great yeah, call. This, yeah, that's right. So yeah, during that time, that correction, that's right. Yeah. And then so you can see the next, um, the next movement is up here, 87.90. Um, if you if you include the B wave here, so we've got two upside targets which are you know getting very interesting to see. Now I don't know at the moment which of those two will eventually cause a, a major peak, uh, whether it's going to stop at 78.90 or not. Um, now I've got a couple of working hypotheses going on at the moment. One is in which this pulls back and then we get up to 87.90, but I have to admit. That if we don't pull back immediately, yeah, and this trades up more immediately to 78.90, if you see that happening in the next weeks, so it trades up there immediately, and then suddenly it pulls back really hard, then we've got a reversal signature. Oh, and then, okay. we, know that, and then we know that 78.90 of these two upside targets, let's go back to the other one, then the 78.90 will be enough. Interesting. Okay. And that means, you know, if we get price rejection there, then we're coming down in wave X to, you know, 55 bucks. Okay. Uh, still looking for 3,200 S&Ps. NASDAQ's made a new high. Russell's threatening again. Um, you've been talking 3,200. I've also seen some uh, corrective uh, calls that you've made. Uh, okay, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this is the this is the daily chart from 2016. This is what I call the grand resynchronization lows, because yeah. um, back in February 16 we had you know a sort of a year 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 and a half uh, correction. Uh, that was certainly the case in um, in Europe, uh, because uh, most of the European markets were unfolding from a peak in 2015 into that 2016 low. But don't forget that um, that also occurred when uh, emerging markets and commodities were forming a major low in early 2016, having had a five-year decline from the 2011 peak. So right. we've got basically everything re-emerging, converging down there. I called it the grand resynchronization, and that was a very one of the clearest signals in my career that we should be buying commodities, emerging markets, you know, S&P, whatnot. And so since then, once I, I just wanted, uh, I, you're one of the first ones that I heard using the uh, synchronized global recovery narrative with what's happening in China, like mm -hmm. with the FXI, you know, being very weak, uh, breaking down, uh, is that narrative still true that we're still in a, a, a synchronized global recovery or is it starting to um, lose a piece here and there of participation? Well, I think it's still basically very much um, in in intact. general growth intact yes i mean the synchronization okay. is aligned i think the you know you've got the shanghai composite which uh, has been taken a hit we can look at that in a moment um but just before i i leave the s and i just want to you know i've this this is an incorrect count this was i've seen this on blogs and everywhere it's completely forget that um this is um this is the s p schematic uh, focusing on just this year and uh, it's sorry the okay. data's just loading um but um, if I give it a bit of a shove, it might encourage it for some reason to come through and be visible. But basically, um, what we've had this year, this is a remarkable pattern, which we recognized very early on in its scenario. And um, uh, it's basically um, a zigzag decline from January's high. Right. But there's some, there's some really added, I mean, this is a very good tutorial for Elliott Wave because there's a lot of different things going on here. Sorry, this is really, not loading very efficiently, but um, it'll come into focus in a moment. Maybe what I'll show you is what we had back in April, because April was this low down here. And uh, by the time we got into mid, late April, we saw this three wave pattern and we knew it should be five waves developing. So we immediately updated this as um, a diagonal 
which um, it's been working perfectly since. Um, if I show you this chart, this is dated 19th of April. Yeah. And you can see the general wedge shape of the diagonal. It's five waves, one, two, three, four, five, like this. But the tip off was the fact that this was a zigzag. Right. 2717. And you can see we had a forecast right that time down to 2590 around the area before it starts to pick up again. Well, right. have a look now. Here's the low, 2594. Right. And here's the Very continuation nice. of it since. It's, it's picture perfect. And um, if we can get up to 2828, that's going to be a very, very interesting thing. And then we're going to get this swoosh down. You know, okay. That's 12% drop. And, yeah. then, and then the lift off again into the year, year end. But uh, it looked like your higher, highest numbers, even after this correction, have come down a bit. Uh, you didn't have 3200. You had like 2995 after this low. So is that um, reading your, oh yeah, 2994. The end. Well, it could. Yeah, it could be a little three. bit higher. Yeah, it could yeah. be a little bit higher than that, actually. Um, this is a sort I'm of, I'm thinking uh, we're good and even like, you know, 4,200 uh, until like, you know, uh, the end of 2019. And then we started generational bear market. And that's, that's the chart right. I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. this is the one you're referring to. This is, now a lot of Elliott guys are talking about one, two, three, four, and a big terminal fifth here. This is not going to work. Why? Because... Um, if we take a look at the emerging markets and the commodity scenario, we're in, in, engaged in an inflation pop at the moment from, from the grand resynchronization lows. That's the second phase beginning here. Right. And those markets are very, very far from complete. Now, the commodity sector is undergoing some rotational corrective declines. Um, That's a good yeah. segue, Peter, because I also remember from our last interview when gold was knocking on the door of a breakout at 1360. You said that, you know, you would go with it in case it was, you know, it, it was uh, the beginning of something. But you said, um, I'm expecting a false breakout if it happens. Mm -hmm. And you had some, you know, at the time, some downside targets um, that we're almost at in gold. Uh, back then you were talking 1220 as a possibility. And... Uh, so here, here we're looking for a pretty good break. Uh, you're looking for a retest of 2017. That's right. Well, um, the reason yeah, I was 20. suspicious. Yeah, the reason yeah. I was suspicious that you know if it did break out above here, we we should be very careful for these these the, these were the big numbers where I thought that if it did break out, yeah. it would hit there and then drop really hard back inside this yeah. range. That would have made yeah. this um, an expanding flat if it had traded up a little bit higher. I was pretty confident yeah. it would be a false breakout because I could see that this entire upswing um, from the December 2016 low, which is basically from this point here onwards, there was lots of overlap. This type of configuration is not consistent with a, with a sustained break above the highs, a new bull market yeah. in other words. It was consistent with a more complex correction where you would formulate a top up here and then it would pull all the way back inside the range. And we didn't get the breakout. I was hoping we would because I wanted to see if um, it would it would suck in a lot of the the institutional yeah. fund managers because at the that beginning was a of the year, call. yeah, they were getting at the beginning of the year. The institutional fund managers were all getting very excited about uh, a more immediate sort of persistent uh, inflationary expectations. And I thought, well, if they they were also you know BlackRock and a few of the big guys were making big noises about inflation picking up, and we saw. Uh, from the CAT that the, the, the long positioning was getting very high and I thought well if this does break out I don't see that that's going to be conducive to a, pro to a pronounced uh, and sustained move up and, and in fact okay. um, in a way it didn't it got defended here and of course you've seen it drop back since right. and I think you know this means that we're going to have to wait until the end of the year early next year uh, like in all the commodities, like copper and and you know other things like that, and the emerging markets before they get down like this, before we can go back in. But I, right. I you know, if anybody's listening and they, you know, they've got disorientated with gold because it's done nothing for the last year and a half, don't be too disorientated because um, when we do get down to these numbers, you're going to have some fantastic buying opportunities. And of course, again, we've got to fight our emotions down here. It will probably feel as if. You know, you're yeah, probably it's going to go to 980. 
you'll sit down there, you'll say, well, could trade yeah. under a thousand. You'll be hearing exactly. that. You're, yeah. you're already hearing that. Oh yeah, yeah, I wouldn't okay. be surprised. I okay. wouldn't be surprised. I remember when we got nearly down to here, people were talking about 800, weren't they, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there's still some 750 guys out there. Well, yeah. you know, let them, let them watch. Peter, another That's great cool. interview, another great interview, buddy. You know, <laughs> excellent cool. views. And why don't you take a minute or two to show your website and and how people could reach you and subscribe and. Okay, uh, that'd be great. Peter, Thanks, Peter. I uh, really think that Peter's uh, someone that you guys should keep an eye on. Well, thanks a lot. I, I really appreciate that, Dale. Well, if anybody's listening and they're interested in Elliott Wave and some of the forecasts that we can make, um, even if you are not into Elliott Wave per se and you're using other methods, um, you can always um, uh, cross-reference what we're saying against your own and measure us up. Um, we're quite used to being uh, put under the microscope in terms of our forecasts and we, we try very much to keep a very high uh, um, uh, degree of uh, of um, um, of forecast to the way that the price action develops. You can always visit us on wavetrack.com. If you do get that far, uh, go to um, subscriptions and you can see a very low cost um, um, subscription to the Elliott Wave Compass Report, which is here. And it's uh, $39 a month. And we publish twice a week uh, some really good reports. And, um, and that's one entry level that you can subscribe to us from. And if you're using Twitter, for example, um, our Twitter account, let me just put that across, um, is shown here. And uh, um, our handle is uh, at Elliot Wave underscore WTI. And we've got a lot of stuff going on. In fact, here we are uh, already. Yeah. Um, our interview today, which is great. And we do put a lot of educational stuff on um, with, uh, this is extracts from our original material. I'm fortunate enough to have some of Elliot's original work, so we post those occasionally. And a very good um, feedback came through on what Elliot called a half moon uh, pattern. And we've written up a lot of that stuff. And this is always accessible through our blog as well. So if you get to our blog, you know, you can see full articles which reference from Twitter and so forth. So that's really how we operate and we'd be loving, you know, love to see and hear from anyone. Well, thank you so much, Peter, and uh, good luck with uh, England in the World <laughs> Cup. All right, maybe you, maybe Thanks. they'll put you in the game so you <laughs> could draw some waves for and patterns for the team to follow. I wish there was something you, I could, yeah, I wish I was, there, was, there was some trends there. I could map it out. The score would be fun. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Good hunting. Appreciate all Thanks, the insights man. and views. So I hope you have a great summer trading season, my trading warrior brother. Thanks for being with us today, bro. Yeah, you're welcome, Dale. And we'll keep in touch. Thanks again to you. Okay, everyone. That's our Turnaround Tuesday with Peter Goodburn. You know where to find him. There's his website, and it's Elliot Wave underscore WTI on Twitter. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the day. Let's see what's happening here before I say goodbye. Euro, still, I'd like to see you close over 1720. Okay, everyone, good hunting. See everyone tomorrow. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Adios. Thanks again, Pete.